All right, hello. I'm Marco. As you can see, I'm a vampire, so I'm suffering right now because of the light. If you have any questions, note this nickname. This is going to be like a curse. I'm going to follow you on the internet and ruin your day. I'm a premise on the internet. I'm Italian, living in Germany. Um, and I'm here to talk about event sourcing. Just um, some kudos to my apprentice, Malkinho. We've worked together on this topic, on this presentation, and on the patterns that we implemented. Really proud of what we achieved together. And this is going to be event sourcing, the good, the bad, and the complicated. Now, I'm going to be a bit fast, and I'm not sure if we've got time for questions. So if you've got any questions, feel free to stop me. I'm going to uh, be here all day and also tomorrow. And I'm gladly going to answer any questions about the topic or the meaning of life, the universe, and everything else, which is a simple answer. Um, so um, first of all, let's put this into context. Because if you're building something architectural, please don't make it too do up. Because what you end up with is Angular 2 or React.js. So um, I have a project. It's called CodeReviews.io. Who here writes code every day? Right, so you're producing work for me, which is good. Your money. I'm just kidding. Right. So what is the plan? The plan is really simple. If you are building a software project, then you need to get somewhere. And that somewhere needs to be money, unless you are a nonprofit organization. But if you're not doing this, then you're wasting your time, in my opinion. At least after all these years of software development, I just don't have the nerves to build something without making any money out of it. So the scenario is simple. I'm going to put it into context so that you understand why we use these architectural patterns first. So um, some clients send us some code, pull request link, or something like that. What we do is we just pull this code down, analyze it with some Scala, some whatever tool we use. Um, and we evaluate how much it's going to cost to review that code. So it's going to be like 500 euro for, I don't know, or a billion pounds, whatever, depending on the rate. So um, the client then pays for the review. So there is a credit card or something that happens there. And uh, the review gets listed on a public marketplace. Then the reviewers need to apply to it. Like, I want to review this. I want to earn this money, kind of like freelancing style tools. Then um, a reviewer is picked by this client, so he's going to go through the list of people that applied and say, this guy or this person. Um, work happens. There is the actual review going on. Payment is completed after that, and that's pretty much it. So we got a few, we got a context where to put this. This is not a product pitch. I'm trying to just explain why we're getting to these patterns. So what you realize is that we have a sequence of interactions that happen in a very precise order. So we have this domain where everything depends on what happened before. And there is a lot of scenarios where people can bail out and say, no, I don't like this, or there is a problem, and so on and so forth. So you have all the ramifications of all the things that can go wrong. Anyone working in e-commerce already knows this. You want people to do the payment, but everything can go wrong before that. And after that, you don't really care. So people can be unhappy with the price. People can be unhappy with the actual work or the applicants with the review. Uh, they just don't trust the person that did the review. And we have external systems. External systems is what everyone is doing nowadays. Who uses microservices? Why? OK, external services are absolutely the worst thing to deal with, because everything that was a problem, a Boolean problem, you want a true and a false, now becomes a true and a false or an HTTP error. So yeah, good luck with that. Um, we got GitHub. GitHub notoriously and traditionally goes down every couple of months, which is fine, to be honest. They do a better job than me anyway. We got Fabricator, which is going to be for the reviews, which may be an internal system. And while we redeploy it, I don't know if it supports zero, zero downtime redeployments or whatever, but you're going to have issues there. Then you have Bitbucket, which is slow. You have GitLab, which is like everyone has its own and none works as expected. You have custom VCS, because everyone lo loves to work on, on Microsoft uh, Visual Source Safe or something like that. Then you've got Stripe which is the single most important thing in the system, because you want to get the money. 
And if a transaction fails because Stripe, you can't contact Stripe, there is a DDoS because your washing machine is deciding to DDoS the internet, then you can't contact Stripe. Then you got notifications. So who uses Mandrill already knows that you have to move away from it. And who uses like something like Mailgun, you always have a DDoS. Every, twi every two weeks you have a DDoS against, uh, um, against Mailgun. And emails are really unsafe. You, you don't know if they're going to arrive, so you want to deal with them in a transactional way. So this doesn't really look well. That's a lot of stuff that can go wrong. Um, so nobody should really embrace a project like this and say, oh yeah, I'm going to build something. Um, because as soon as money is involved, people become sharks. They're going to be really angry when something goes wrong and you are dealing with their money. So, um, except that I and my apprentice had a plan, so we started building on it. So, let's go back a second and let's go with a traditional application. In a traditional application, what happens is that you start some transaction, some business transaction. Um, this is usually a database transaction. Then the business logic is executed. You're calling some kind of service. Then inside your service somewhere, there is an ORM computing some changes. And I'm at fault here because I also maintain an ORM. Um, then the ORM will throw the, the changes at the database. And what you got at the end of the transaction is the final state. Now, does anybody see the problem here? I don't know. Who are these people? Why are they dead? Who killed them? What was the reason? You know, who died first? We don't know about that. So um, these are all things that actually are important when you're debugging a problem, because what we do when debugging is trying to find out state transitions. That's when you fire up the debugger and try to figure out why this variable is x or y. So if there's any functional programmer here, they already know that. But in general, immutability is really powerful when it comes to debugging problems. So we're going to look at event sourcing. Now, event sourcing, anybody heard of it? Anybody not heard of it? Anybody that knows exactly what it's about? Nobody. Well, I saw two hands up. All right. So event sourcing is a system that instead of saving state, what the current state of the application is, what event sourcing does is it saves all the state transitions. Specifically, what you do is you save events. An event is a state mutation, and an event has a name also. So when you have a shopping cart and you check out, it's not going to be update shopping cart set purchased equals one where blah, blah, blah. That's not what you do. You say insert into events user purchased the shopping cart. That's what you do. So you have a giant stack of everything that happened inside your application, and the state is just computed from it. So you're moving away from changing state, because every time you have an update or a delete inside your system, you are losing data. And if you have an auditing system, you don't understand what is going on anyway. Um, instead, you are actually saving the deltas, the changes inside your system. You're saving them, and then everything else comes from there. That is your source of truth. Your source of truth is the sum of all these deltas. That is why it's called event sourcing. The source of truth is now a series of business transactions, which we are going to compact in a series of events. So we are saving consequences. We're saving what happened in the real world or in our system. So in the real world, and that is really important, uh, that's because shit happens. You are going to have an accident. Your Warehouse, if you are working in e-commerce, is going to go on fire. People are going to just destroy all the shelves and whatever. So you have to deal with it. And you're not going to write your software system to deal with every possible tiny scenario that may happen in the real world. You're not going to build a UI for when everything is on fire. Oh, everything is on fire. Please call the office and tell them to insert that it's on fire. Uh, it sounds logic. So. You're not controlling the state of the world anymore. You're not trying to build something for everything that may happen. You just add more events. You say, this happened, and you save it to your system. And then you will deal with what the consequences of that are later. Other things that I like of this approach is that when you combine it with another architectural pattern, which is called CQS, invented by Greg Young, I think, in 2006 or something like that, 
Anybody doing .NET? Right? Okay, the .NET world has, do, has been doing this for ages. I'm a PHP guy, don't throw tomatoes at me. I just like PHP. I hate it at the same time. Um, so when you combine event sourcing with CQRS, you tell your system to do something and it will do it. And it will retry, 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 retry until it gets there. So another thing that is awesome about reasoning in these state transactions is that you have formally formal mechanisms to define the system in a way that is not based around state, but is based around interactions. Who here starts a software project designing an ER schema with MySQL Workbench or something like that? I did that. See a few hands up. Don't need to be shy. We all did that. We all do that anyway. And it's fine for some systems. But what we're doing is we're creating a UML diagram, an interaction diagram uh, about how the system actually is instead of what the system does. Instead, we have these new approaches, for example, this one by Alberto Brandolini, uh, other crazy Italian guy. Um, and you look at what can happen in the system. You go and do a meeting with all the business people and say, this is what can happen, and this is what happens next, and these are the possible outcomes, and this is what the user can do next, and so on and so forth. So you're designing by use case first, and when you apply event sourcing and CQRS, against what you put on a wall in a meeting with the business people, you can transpose this one-to-one -one into code. There is no impedance between that. You're not going to design some kind of weird service layer or whatever. This actually comes out one-to-one -one from the sticky notes into your code, which is amazing. Because then what happens is that you can take a bug, show it to a business person, and he or she may be able to analyze this and and figure out if there is a problem in the business logic. Now, I'm not going into the formalities too much. There is a book about it by Alberto, and he's been releasing it on LeanPub. Um, so um, you can look at that stuff. But what is awesome is that now we have this thing called um, event storming. That's the kind of uh, design approach there. And we have a way to map external systems. So we put just sticky notes, and we know where things can go wrong, because we are interacting with Stripe here and with Visa here and whatever. You have a mapping of everything that is uncontrollable events. So when somebody comes up with something that may happen in your system, you just add a sticky note, and then from there you figure out what are the possible outcomes. You're not going to design upfront for all of this, but you're going to discover them as you go. And you're having a time sequence of everything that can happen in your system. It's not about looking at a database scheme and trying to figure out how and in which order you're going to do the inserts and what records are going to exist first and later. You actually have a time sequence, an idea of what the system does. So that was the good part. Now, let's go to the ugly part. It's ugly first because it's code and second because it's PHP. So if you're not used to this, feel free to like close your eyes. It's not that terrible, though. Uh, my PHP looks like Java and the worst Java as well. So let's start with events. Right. I told you it would look like Java. So we have our user provided a private pull request to be reviewed. This means that somebody gave us a link to a private pull request in some repository, and we want to analyze it. This is what an event looks like. So for those more versed in architectural words, it's pretty much a value object, data transfer object. Call it however you want. It has some state. That is final, immutable. We don't have the final modifier in PHP, so I do my best to do it at API level. It has some more fields. As you can see, I don't use primitives. Um, primitives are bad in general, so use the mind concepts in it. I extend from something in a framework here. It's not so important. I hate it because it's domain-driven development, and you should not use framework stuff inside your domain. But this gets shit done. If you're not doing that, you're spending a half of your life just trying to figure out how to serialize and deserialize these events for no good reason. Or you're going to fill it up with annotations, which is the same terrible thing. So um, now that is what an event is. It's a point in time, something happens. There is some context of what happened and why it happened. Uh, you gave it a name. That is the most important thing. You gave it a name. So when that happens, you have a very precise name of that event. And that is what you're going to persist and load from your database. 
Now, events are usually fired, and this is an object-oriented approach. There is a functional approach. Come to me and talk about it uh, with me later for people that are doing functional programming. So an aggregate root is pretty much a wall. It is the thing that you interact with when doing a domain interaction. So you take from your framework or whatever controller or whatever API you use, you call this aggregate root, and behind it, there's your domain. So it's a wall between you and the domain logic. And for those who are less versed in DDD, it's pretty much like an entity. So it has an identifier and stuff like that. So uh, it is the entity that we interact with. This is how it looked like. So we have a code review. It extends, again, some framework stuff that I hate, but gets stuff done. It has an identifier. This is really important. It has an ID. And it has a lot of state, a lot of state, because this is a state machine. Now, you can simplify it, extract, refactor, whatever, but it is, at the end of the day, a state machine. You can use the state pattern if you want to avoid state mutations. What you notice is that these fields change over time because some things happen in your system, and the state changes. So um, another thing that is interested, uh, interesting here is that all this state is transient. This is not saved to some database. All this stuff is not saved somewhere. Now, what happens instead is that instead of having a normal constructor where you pass in some state, what you're doing is you recreate this aggregate from the list of events that compose it. So it is an object that every time you want to recreate it, you're going to loop over all of its history. And of course, there are better ways of doing it. You're going to go through every event, and from every event, extract some state and put it in here. So you're going to really pass in a series of events, loop through them, and recreate state. Does that make any sense? Doesn't look too complicated. So we are pretty much replaying all the state transitions inside the state machine. Now, um, from the outside, you don't see this. There is no explicit way of knowing that this thing is actually producing or, or doing events inside. From the outside, it's just encapsulated state. Um, but what you can do is you can pop all the recorded events. So when you do a business transaction, you call something on this object. At the end of the interaction, you can ask it, like, what are the outcomes? What events come out of it? You can design it this way. You can design it in other ways if you prefer f uh, functional approach and so on. Um, it behaves like a normal entity on the outside. In the inside, it produces events. This is how it works. So you have a, you start here. This is a named constructor or factory method, however you want to call it. You pass in some state. And what it does is internally, it will create an event. Now, as you can see, I am really, really, really paranoid about, I mean, I probably can find better naming for this, but. I'm not a native English speaker, so I usually just find things that I don't understand when I try to simplify. So I prefer using name the composition on the naming. Maybe that's the German influence there. But so you're pretty much recording an event. And that's it. All right. So it looks like a typical entity. There's nothing special about it. So except that inside it's not saving state, it's just replaying and replaying all the state internally. And when you want to save it, you just get all the events that are now new and put them in a database. All right. So who calls the aggregate? The aggregate is called by the application layer. And the application layer usually looks like this. So you got a um, repository, these code reviews. This is just a repository, uh, familiar to anyone, I suppose could be a database, whatever, object, but generally a repository is a good idea. Then you do an interaction on it. So this is actually causing some state mutation. You can write it this way. You can write it in a functional way with no state mutations. And then you store the code review. And this repository is going to hide away the idea that there are events in it. It's going to do the pop recorded events and store them in the database. So this, when you compose it in CQRS, is usually happening in a, uh, in a command handler. Command handler, class naming is not so important, but what is important is that it has usually an access to the repository and eventually some services. 
it receives a command, which is a data transfer object that comes from your application layer. So in your, if you're using uh, Java, Spring, JaxRS, or if you're using, um, I don't know, Laravel for PHP, you can take your request object, convert it to this command object, pass it down to um, your command bus, and it's going to go here, which is a function. And this function, all it will do is, it will, in this scenario, just save to the repository a new code review. Right? Doesn't le look too complicated here. Um, this is what it looks like at the end of the day, and usually the other scenarios are pretty much like uh, this one. So get it from the repository, do something, and save. But that's the typical interaction anyway. So now you got all these events. You're recording, recording, recording events. And all these events go to one giant table which is pretty much your data lake, and it is your source of truth, and we call that the event stream. It is an event stream because every time you insert, it's going to react to your inserts, and you can listen to events. You can use the observer pattern to listen to stuff. You can use a database trigger when insert, blah, 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 and so on and so forth, because you can do it on a replica or whatever you prefer. You can loop through past events, and you can reconstruct state you can get the current events and um, react to them, produce new commands, new things that have to happen. And it is immutable. It is an append-only data structure. If you have past events, you can trust them forever, which means that you can cache as much as you want. Any state cache to a certain point in time, all you need to do is to check whether there is new state. But you don't need to change or worry about data updating in the background, which means that you can replicate this to 100 different servers and do 100 different things without ever worrying about mutating state or updating indexes and stuff like that. You're going to only append data to this. So you can use something called a projector. And a projector is pretty much taking events, a list of events, the entire stream, or just the last event. That's up to you. You can run them as the events happen, or you can run them every night at midnight or something like that. And what they do is they take state and push it to a different data structure. Anyone doing betting, in the, working in the betting industry, video or analytics or stuff like that. So what you do is you, instead of recording, um, or instead of refreshing the home page and redoing the queries against your data store to produce some kind of complicated view every time, what you do is, since usually writes happen really rarely, you take events and produce a very specialized view, and then you push it, for example, to Varnish. So your home page doesn't need to be re-rendered every time somebody hits it. You just re-render it every time somebody in the back end does an update, because you have a new event, and your projector is going to push directly to Varnish, and nobody even has to hit your uh, actual application. So projector name is not so important, because it's a technical thing has usually access to a database connection or a cache or whatever you want to call it here. And uh, it gets an event. So this is a user provided a private pull request to be reviewed. That's the event that we saw before. And it is going to insert that event into our table. Well, not the event itself, but it is going to create some state in the table. So this is taking events such as new pull requests that come in and it's just populating a table that says which pull requests are currently in my system. It's nothing complicated. And just creating a different view of my uh, event store, but doing it with writes, not via the read operation. The other thing that is really cool is that you now have a separate concept called event handler or process manager. It depends on the framework that you're using. That's the naming that they use. Um, if anybody's using Symfony, Zen framework or Laravel, you know that event handlers usually are used for framework level events. So things like there is a dispatch going on, there is routing going on, there is persistence going on. These are actually not events, these are hooks. So we messed up on the naming there. Should have been hook manager instead of event manager. So process manager is probably a better name. What they do is they take events and do something else. So when this happens, then that happens. If this, then that. That's not really so complicated. So when a user subscribes, then send him an email confirming his subscription. When a user does not sign in for six months, then send him a notification. When this happens, then ha that happens, and so on and so forth. 
So it takes an event, fires a command. You see we're closing the loop. Events are being produced by business interactions, command calls inter business interactions, and then you have this loop. So that's how it looks like. This is analyze a pull request from a provided private GitHub pull request. This means that when a GitHub pull request from a private repository comes into our system, we have this command bus, which is just a function again. It's a uh, unpure function because you push to it and you never return, so it's a fire for get. Um, you take the event, take the event, things that happened, and then just push to the command bus a new command and say start analyzing. So you're breaking your front end that receives the request, new pull request, saves the event, and somewhere a worker is going to execute this command at a later point in time because this may take 20 seconds, one hour, you don't know. And this is true for pretty much every interaction that it handles input output. So one thing to make clear is that we now define the concept of a projector and a listener. We split them, listener or process manager. Uh, a projector, you can run it multiple times and recreate state as many times as you want. A listener, you can't. You can't rerun a listener because you're going to send all the registration emails to all users again. And it's going to be a mess. So let's recap. Um, that's pretty much the architecture. You have somewhere up here, there's your web framework, your front end, whatever you want to use. Could be a UI. Then you have a command bus, which is a void function, doesn't really return anything. You pass in a command, which you're building from your request, from your event in the front end, such as a click event or something like that. You create, you pass in some parameters. Then you have the command handler, which is on the other side of the command bus. The command bus decides when and how this is going to be called. Um, so it may happen now, it may happen in a year. Depends on your, whether you're using an immediate command dispatch or a message queue or AWS Lambda. That's actually what you put in Lambda, this part, which is really cool. So you get rid of servers this way. The um, command handler will load a thing, which is our aggregate. It will load it from the event stream. You give it the event stream and an identifier, which usually comes from the command. Then you do something on the aggregate. And what is really interesting is that you pass services into the aggregate. If there is input output with external systems that may fail, the aggregate does the interaction. It's not you doing the interaction and then passing the results to the aggregate. That's because the state machine needs to readjust itself if the operation fails. And then you add the recorded events. That's the, again, object-oriented way. And then somewhere else, in a worker, in a cron job, whatever you want to call it, you have this loop, and you're going to run all the projectors for the events and all the listeners for the event. In a reactive world, this is a stream, so you just loop over the new ones, and you can decide whether to loop over the old ones for the projectors. What is really cool as well is that now we can graph our entire domain. We just take these commands and all these events, we know which one causes which one, and we glue them together. Now, I am terrible at graphing. As you can see, this is really, really useful for getting a headache. But if you put it in a more streamlined way, um, graph it a better way, then it looks like this. Um, so what is interesting is that now, let's say that you have a failure here on a create staging GitHub request. You can talk with a business person. Now, of course, this is GitHub, so all of us are kind of domain experts, I suppose. Um, if something goes wrong here, I can talk to a business person, and he's going to say, he or she is going to say, oh, this was not supposed to be here. Why did the system get here? Because he, understand, he or she understands all of these concepts. These are names that are part of the business discussions. Now let's go to the bad bits and then for food. Um, each interaction now, each interaction, each feature that you're writing now becomes an aggregate method. That's your business logic and all the, trans uh, the state transitions inside the aggregate. So that's your domain logic, what you really, really, really want to test. Each interaction causes one or more domain events to be triggered. That's the actual state transition. If there is no domain events, that means that the system didn't move at all. You are going to have a command, which is what initializes that interaction. You're going to have the command handler, which is glue code. Um, 
if you find a decent way to abstract these away, I want to hear about that. You have projectors and schema changes coming from those projectors. And it is fine to just keep adding tables, new tables for every projector. Just duplicate data like, like crazy. It works. It's fine. Um, and then you have related listeners. So when this event happens, then next command. And that may be the next feature. So you have the next feature coming up. You see that we split here. We got a wall between what is this feature and what is the next one, which means that you don't have blurred lines between one feature and the next one. You just Every time you have a new feature, this means new command, new events, new business transaction, everything new. And you never like really change the past ones. So on one side, you wrote these six things, which is a lot of work. On the other side, it's really easy to test them. They work pretty much um, in a very uh, clean and simple way. Um, and they keep running. And it's really, really stable this way. But the other problem is that this is really, really hard to uh, explain to developers. So be because developers are used to this or Amish approach, where you save to something and read from that something, you don't do that anymore. Uh, we like having this uh, symmetric write and read operations. And that's kind of what gets away from all this. Uh, message queues become the central part of your system, uh, which means that you have a point of failure there. But on the other side, you pretty much can retry events, uh, sorry, retry commands all the time. Because commands get from the command bus into this um, message queue, at least if you use a message queue, which you should. And this means that you need to reason about it syn uh, asynchronously. So if you have, how many here are front end developers? Right, what happens is that when you click a button, when you load the next page, what you expect to see is the list of entries. Let's say that we wanted to insert something, and the entry may not be there, because the message queue didn't process the command yet. Which means that from a front-end perspective, you change, you shift away from saying, from letting the user wait a refresh. Instead, you tell them, we you got your request, we're going to deal with it. Um, usually happens really quick, but your system may be busy processing something else, so it may take more than a second to actually have the new view to show to the user. Which means that this scales really, really well. You can just add workers on the back end, and the front end is really, really simple. All it does is it takes commands and pushes them to the queue. So it's really, really hard to bring this down. Um, and you can retry commands. If a failure is because your database went offline, or if a mail system went offline, or something like that, you just get an exception, push back to the queue, and retry. Simple enough. And then if you fail multiple times, you just push to the dead letter exchange and then deal with it later. So all of this is relatively new. And you're going to do a lot of mistakes now. This is a talk for PHP people still. So let's do some of the mistakes that we had when, when building this. So we, um, we got mixed up in domain logic and business logic. Um, so infrastructure is anything that you don't really care about when designing the tool. I know that there are some infrastructure people here. Sorry. Um, but it's not really that important, uh, at least when designing the concepts inside your domain. What is interesting is that the commands, which are usually just some data transfer objects that are more technical, they become part of the domain. Because uh, you tell the name of the command to a business person. And the business person will look at it and understand what it's about. Command handlers are not. They are just garbage code. So initially, we put all the command handlers in the domain, and then I realized this is silly. Um, listeners or process managers are in the domain. This if this, then that is something that you bring to business people. And you talk with them, and you realize that they understand what is going on there. So these are part of the domain. The projectors, which are just copying state from A to B, are not. Just because you have a counter with like how many users are registered to your website in the footer of your website, that doesn't mean that it's part of the domain. Some fancy view of stuff. Other things that we did wrong, events being way too fat. Now, events, events are persisted. They are your source of truth. And once you created them, once you save them, you can never or never alter them. So they're going to be forever. As I said, it is an append-only structure. You're never modifying the past. It's not like Git where you can rebase. 
It is just like that. It's a single stream, loads of events. In the past, you never update them. And when you have those scenarios where you have to update them, you usually try to find a different way of doing it. So this means that you want to have tiny uh, events. Um, because what happens is that you will, at some point, because you are used to it, have something like record preferences. So a user goes into his user profile and updates his personal information, username, first name, last name, and so on. So what we have is that when you add a field to this interface, you're going to have some changes in the event, because you now have new fields in the event. And this is a mess to deal with. Um, the same happens when a field inside an event changes semantic meaning. It changes from being a Boolean to being something more complicated or something like that. So what you should do instead is you split into small events, such as user changed username. User provided a new avatar. User provided a new blog URL, and so on. This becomes annoying, because this means writing more projectors. But on the other side, it allows you to be more fine-grained on the business interactions and more stable when going forward. So other things that we did wrong, executing business logics in, in event handlers, in, in um, process managers. So what we did is we just called directly something on the aggregate inside the event handlers. And this means that every time an event was raised, and you may have hundreds of them in the same process, because we fired the process managers in the same process, you are going to have another 100 events. And these 100 events will go through other process managers and fire another 100 events, and so on and so forth. So you're DDoSing yourself without realizing it. Um, other things that happen is that you have bra you're breaking transactional integrity, because uh, the process managers are not designed to be transactionally safe. And that's on purpose. Uh, it's not actual logic. You're just taking a, an event and saying, what has to happen next? You're not making it happen. You're just telling the system what to try next. And it really scales bad, because as I said, you're DDoSing yourself instead of pushing to the message queue. One good example of this is, let's say that you have a command which is import users from CSV. How many people here imported a set of users in a mailing list or something via CSV file? A lot of us, right? So what you do is you influx this command. Then you have 100 users. You do what you need to do, and at user 99, the system crashes because there is invalid data or whatever. This happens every freaking time. Instead, if you just split into new commands, it will succeed for the first 98, and the 99th user will just have a failure in the command handler. Um, if you do in event handlers logic like this, you're going to have race conditions as well. You're going to have optimistic locking issues. I'm not going into there. You can talk to me ab about it later. Uh, so what you do is just push commands to the queue. And the queue is just going to deal with it when it has time. So other things that we did wrong is executing business logic outside of the aggregate. So asking the aggregate what to do, and then deciding whether we do it or not. That's not how it's supposed to, do, to, to, to be done. So um, in general, for every command and every command handler, you should have one aggregate method, which is one business interaction. If you have a different business interaction, just name it differently, make a new command. So the aggregate is responsible for all its consistency because it's a state machine. That's all it does. So it denies anything that is not a valid action. And um, asking it if something is valid is an anti-pattern here. So it's like a black box. You tell it what to do. And all it can do is either silently accept and produce events or reject it and say, no, you can't because the user didn't pay yet. Uh, you can't ship this product because the user hasn't paid. Or you can't pay because the, the product wasn't shipped. Depends on your business logic there. Um, you can skip the aggregate sometimes, which is really cool. And that's part of the real world. In the real world, shit can happen. So what you could have is a help desk. Let's take an e-commerce system. You have a checkout. And the user goes to the checkout and figures out, oh, I don't have a credit card. I, I can't pay by credit card. Um, and this is really common in Europe. Uh, so what we're going to do is I'm going to do a bank transaction. And I'm going to call their support and give them the confirmation ID for the SIPA transfer. And the support, what they can do is they can just add an event and say, this shopping cart was paid. So you manually dealt with it. And the system unstucks itself. But what is cool about this is that you didn't have to design a UI. You didn't have to design an entire system around it. 
Support simply produced a manual event because something happened in the real world that you are not going to design inside your aggregate or inside your business logic. You're not going to have commands for it. All right, let's go to the last bit here because I'm out of time. So first of all, use boring technology. All right, every time I hear about this, everyone is going to go, I'm going to use Event Store, I'm going to use Kafka, I'm going to use this and that, I'm going to use this particular message queue, whatever. No. This is already way, complica way too complicated. There is a lot of change, and you're going to screw up on it when you implement it the first time, if you're interested at all. So we use Postgres and only Postgres. And since we didn't have many scalability problems, and feel free to throw something at me, we use it even as a work queue, as a message queue, because I'm lazy, and I don't want to have 10 external systems that can go offline. I'm the opposite of microservices. I hate that. It's just too many things that can go wrong. We like our database transactions, and they work fine for inserting events and guaranteeing that the events make it to the database, and you got your commit. And after that commit, you got your replication done and everything, which is perfect. So replicate to your backup servers, whatever. You got uh, JSONB support in it, which means that it works kind of like a NoSQL database as well. Um, you can try using MySQL for it. Probably suicidal, but... Um, use boring technology in general. Don't try to be fancy and use some web scale technology that nobody understands. Uh, don't focus too much on performance. This thing scales really well on its own because all your front end does is produce a command, push it to a queue, and it will be executed later, which means that the average interaction is going to be something like 20, 15 milliseconds for a PHP system. And if you're writing something in Scala or Haskell or whatever, or Erlang, it's going to be two milliseconds and maybe the overhead of the HTTP uh, response assembling. So the command bus deals with this complexity for you. It splits the hard, slow part from the actual user interaction. So the application is snappy. It's really fast. <laughs> Other things. You don't need to make a projection for everything. Something like, give me the last registered user is perfectly fine to be queried on the event stream. You just say select from event stream where user has registered is equal to name. Well, name is equal user has registered. And that's going to give you the last registered user. You don't need to query or create a table or a cache entry for everything. It's fine. And as last advice, as I said, we put it in context. There is a domain that is very time-based. Do not use this stuff if you don't have a specific use case for event sorting. Thank you very much.